Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sotheby's. It is my very great pleasure to see you all here this evening. I would like to start the bid with perhaps our most exciting item, the love letters of Mr. John Keats, romantic poet to his beloved Fanny Brawl. Do I see any offers? Five shillings. Ten shillings. Ten shillings. shillings. Oh. Fifteen shillings. Thank you, sir. In the jumper, fifteen shillings. Any more bids, ladies and gentlemen? Twenty. Thirty. Thank you. Yes. Any more? Any more? Thirty from the lady at the back. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. Thank you, madam. Forty. Any more? Fifty. Thank you, sir. Fifty. Fifty-five. Fifty-five from the man in the coat at the back. Any more, sir? Would you like to meet that? Oh, come on. <laughs> 102 shillings. <laughs> Any raises on 102 shillings from the man in the silly coat at the back. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> no? Going once then? Going twice? Sold! <laughs> Welcome to um, this talk on Oscar Wilde's Love Beyond the Grave. My name is Michelle Mendelssohn. I teach English literature at Mansfield College, Oxford, and you have seen my wonderful English literature students. Tonight, the story we have to tell you is the story of Oscar Wilde's love for John Keats. The only problem was they were separated by several decades, um, Keats having died long before Oscar Wilde did. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Keats who this man was that Oscar Wilde fell in love with um, so deeply. Keats, the man you see here on the left, born in 1795 in London. Um, he was born to a London stableman and to his very sensuous wife. He was a short man, um, quite a lot shorter than our Keats, our zombie Keats tonight, um, who's back there. Um, but he was a good fighter, good with his fists, and he had to be. He had to be a fighter in life because both of his parents died by the time he was 15. And so he was taken under the wing of a guardian who decided that despite his poetic tendencies, what the young John Keats really needed was to become an apothecary. And so he trained as an apothecary and surgeon at Guy's Hospital in London, and then just as he was becoming qualified at the age of 20, because back then you could qualify at the age of 20 not just begin studying medicine, he gave it all up. He'd fallen in with a bunch of poets, poets with names like William Hazlitt, Charles Lamb, Percy Shelley, and especially Lee Hunt. And so he decided to give up his medical career for a poetic career. By the next year, age 21, he was producing remarkable poems. And perhaps the greatest one of, his, um, of these early poems um, is a sonnet called On First Looking Into Chapman's Homer. And no sooner has he written that than he begins to write Sleep in Poetry, which lays out the plan for his entire poetic career. He slowly begins to model his career on the life of great poets. The next year, aged only 22, it's only 1817, he composes a 4,000 line um, allegory called Endymion. Now, Endymion is really important for Keats because it lays out a mortal's quest for an ideal feminine beloved, a sort of counterpart, a helpmeet. And in this flawless happiness that they would share, um, he discovers all that is possible for him in this happy, happy union. No sooner had he envisioned this, dreamt up this woman, than it seemed she appeared, and her name was Fanny Braun. She was 18. She was, like Keats's mother, quite sensuous. Um, and the two fell deeply, deeply in love. But of course, marriage was impossible for one reason, uh, or for several reasons, actually. One reason being Keats's poverty, the other reason being Keats's tuberculosis, which is manifesting in all sorts of intriguing ways. Um, Keats's tuberculosis, um, which was at the time called consumption, of course. Um, this is what has people coughing into their hankies in all those period, um, period films we see. So to bring you back to the auction with which we began, in 1885 at Sotheby's, a young man, then aged 29, came to this auction where Keats's love letters to his beloved Fanny Braun were being auctioned. Why were they being auctioned? Because Fanny's family had fallen on hard times and they needed the money. And so there was this 29-year-old sitting in the audience, a 29-year-old who was married, quite conventionally, to a woman called Constance, 
Just that year, they'd moved into a house, quite a nice house, actually, 16 Tite Street in Chelsea. Um, the next year, they would have a son, Cyril, again, very convention conventional, this young man. He fancied himself a bit of a poet. He had published a slim volume of poems titled Poems. Um, it had been very poorly reviewed. The Oxford Union had rejected it, saying it was plagiarism, essentially. He had tried his hand at plays. Again, no success. But this young man was in love with John Keats. And this young man was Oscar Wilde. And the poem that Oscar Wilde wrote that was inspired by this auction was called On the Sale by Auction of Keats's Love Letters. These are the letters which Endymion wrote to one who loved in secret and heart. And now the drawers of the auction are far and big for each poor dotted note. I, through such repulsive passion, quote the merchant's price. I think they love not art that break the crystal of the poet's heart. Is it not said that many years ago, in a far eastern town, soldiers came with torches through the midnight to gamble for their unfair raiment and dice upon the garments of a wretched man, not knowing the cause of wonder or his work? Let's step back to 1877. We began in 1885. Let's step back to 1877. Step back in time to the summer of Oscar Wilde's final year at Oxford before he became a zombie, <laughs> before Keats was a zombie. In his final year at Oxford, um, where he was an undergraduate at Modern College, um, he decided to go to Rome with some friends. And while he was in Rome, he could think of nothing better than to visit Keats's grave. And this is the painting of Keats's grave that we have here in the Ashmolean, um, which is upstairs, and unfortunately it's in the gallery that you can't see tonight. You can come back another day and see it. And right next to it is a painting um, also the same artist, William Scott, um, a painting of the grave of Shelley. What's interesting about these paintings is not just the relevant, of course, um, but the fact that Wilde actually saw these paintings. So these were the same paintings that Wilde, when you come back, you will see the same paintings that Wilde um, himself saw. So the question, you know, to ask, I think, is why did Wilde make this pilgrimage? Why, when he went to Rome, did he think that going to the grave of Keats was the best thing he could do? I think there are really two reasons. He was looking for poetry. He found it at Keats's grave. Um, at Keats's grave, he could be inspired by the very person who had written the poem, one of the poems Wilde admired the most, a poem called Bright Star, Would I Were Steadfast as Thou Art, which you'll hear again, or not again, which you'll hear for the first time a little bit um, later. The other thing that happened at this grave and during this trip to Italy, which is quite magical, is that Wilde got the inspiration for the poem that would set off what seemed to be, at the time, a glorious career. It was while in Italy that Wilde was inspired to write a poem called Ravenna. And this was the poem that would win him the Newdigate Prize in the following year. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Newdigate Prize is a poetry prize that's awarded annually for the best composition in English verse by an Oxford undergraduate. It's still run today. Applications are still open. Um, so you too could be in that lineage. And so Wilde entered and he won. And this Newdigate Prize was the mark, it seemed, of a glorious um, poetic career. Um, and just so you know, um, the other people who have won the Newdigate since Wilde include John Ruskin, Matthew Arnold, Alan Hollinghurst, a little closer to our time, and Andrew Motion. So it has a quite an august, um, quite an august lineage. When we think about Keats's poetry, I think one of the things that really emerges and, and is inescapable is its sensuousness. It calls on all of our senses. And this was what Wilde really was trying to channel by making this pilgrimage to Keats's grave. This is what he admired the most about Keats's writing. It was a total experience. Mm -hmm. You read a poem, but you felt it, you smelt it, you touched it, it became part of you. And so there was this embodied part of Keats's poetry that appealed to Wilde. There was also what Wilde called the felicity of phrasing. It was beautifully written. Um, and there was also something which Wilde would eventually steal, which was this tension Keats liked to play with between opposites. 
between pleasure and pain, between love and death, between sensation and indolence and vigor. He was interested in social consciousness but aesthetic detachment at the same time. So these qualities that eventually became Wilde's qualities were also Keats's qualities. And I think that when Wilde made this pilgrimage in Rome to the grave, in a sense he was trying to commune with that kind of oppositional um, spirit. But most of all, and I've really left the biggest reason um, for last, most of all the reason Wilde made this pilgrimage to the grave of Keats was that Wilde imagined himself, like Keats, as a sort of gifted, tragic young genius. Already as an Oxford undergraduate, he wanted this sort of fate, uh, which is a strange thing to say, but he wanted this sort of um, gift of genius that Keats had had and was trying to get it for himself. And so the experience of Keats's grave led him to compose the grave of Keats. Within the last of all worlds injustice and all dismay, he lies at last beneath God's veil of blue. Take him back, alive and love and The youngest of the martyrs here is laid, as fair as Sebastian and as early as No cypress shades his grave, no funeral you, but gentle violence weeping with the dew. Over his bones creep the never blossoming chain. Oh, proud heart that broke for misery, oh, the fairest lips since those of Italy. Tears like mine will keep thy memory green as Isabella did. No, So I take you now to Louisville, Kentucky, probably a spot you didn't expect to be going tonight. But I take you there because that was where Wilde next encountered um, signs of his um, beloved Keats. In 1882 in Kentucky, Wilde met a woman who had the same nose as Keats, the same profile as Keats, in fact. Wilde was in the United States and in Canada in 1882 um, giving lectures on interior decoration, on art, on beauty. He was the aesthetic apostle. And so one night in Louisville, Kentucky, while he was lecturing and sort of doing his standard um, thing, he concluded um, his talk by referencing Keats's sonnet on blue, this poem, this exquisite poem which you'll hear in a moment. And by a happy chance in the audience that night, listening to Wilde was Keats's niece. Um, her zombie <laughs> incarnation is here with us tonight. Keats's niece, Emma Keats Speed, who was the daughter of Keats's brother, George. George had emigrated to the United States, um, had made some poor investments, um, but the family had decided to stay in the United States. Um, and so there she was, Emma Keats Speed, listening to Wilde that night. And following the lecture, Mrs. Speed and Wilde were introduced to each other, and they arranged to meet the next day in her home. She invited him over, and it turned out she had Keats manuscripts, manuscripts from her uncle, John Keats. Um, and the way Wilde described this woman was as a lady of middle age with a sweet, gentle manner and a most musical voice. And he said that he spent most of the next day with her, reading the letters of Keats to her father, poring over torn yellow leaves and faded scraps of paper. I think the most important thing was that the way he looked at her, she seemed the incarnation of this person he admired so, so deeply. Um, and so that really um, stayed with him. And so, imagine the scene. On the 21st of February, 1882, while Oscar Wilde was lecturing on the English Renaissance of Art in Louisville, Kentucky. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Byron was a man, and Shelley was a dreamer, but in the calmness and clearness of his vision, his perfect self-control, his, his unnerving sense of beauty, and his recognition of a separate realm of the imagination, Keats was the true, serene artist, and his poem, Sonnet on Blue, is a perfect example of his fine sense of colour harmonies. Blue! Tis the light of heaven, tis the domain of Cynthia. Tis the wide palace of the sun, tis the tent of Esmeralda. 
all the stops and streams, pools numberless, may rage and foam and fret, but never subside if not to dark blue may do. Blue, gentle cousin of the forest green, married to green blue, sweetest flowers, forget me not, bluebell, and that queen of secrecy, the violet. What strange powers hast thou, as a mere shadow? When in an arm thou art alive, be fed. Keats's legacy was indeed alive with fate, and 13 years later, what happened to Keats, in a sense, happened to Wilde. Wilde was cut down at the height of his success in 1895 in London, and his home, 16 Tite Street, the place he had made with his wife Constance, where his sons, Cyril and Vivian, were growing up. His home was the site of an auction, and you can see this police news um, sort of cover page story from the time showing the sale of Wilde's effects um, in the lower um, corner. The irony in this is that 1895 actually began on a high note. All of the failure that had marked Wilde's early career, all of this desire for genius, all of the lack of success he'd had as a poet, as a dramatist, um, as a critic, it had all come good. It's beginning in 92, and in 95, he was off the charts. In 95, um, the year began with An Ideal Husband, which premiered at the Haymarket Theatre. So the, all the society comedies that brought him money and fame start to kick off. The, an Ideal Husband was followed by The Importance of Being Earnest at the St. James Theatre, <coughs> premiering on Valentine's Day, and both plays give him the public acclaim, the reputation that he so desires. After a decade in the public eye, he's finally made it. That was January. By February, things were starting to turn. After Valentine's Day, two weeks after Valentine's Day, in fact, it was revealed to a certain young man's father that Wilde had taken a great interest in him. And this young man was Lord Alfred Douglas, and his father was the Marquess of Queensbury. And Marquess of Queensbury determined that his son would have nothing to do with Oscar Wilde. They, uh, the, the two of them had met four years earlier, and so the Marquess decided to leave a note at Wilde's club. It was subtle, and it was unsubtle. It said, for Oscar Wilde, posing somme de might. He couldn't quite spell the word sodomite, but the message still came across. Don't do that with my son, basically. This was in February. Wilde took great offense, and he decided to sue the Marquess of Queensbury. This was very ill-advised. By the start of April, Queensbury had found witnesses to support his claim. People were starting to gather, people with voices who were saying, yes, I've seen Oscar Wilde, mm, I've seen how he goes about, and not just with Lord Alfred Douglas. By the 5th of April, Wilde was arrested and charged with criminal offences under the Criminal Law Amendment Act. By the 25th of April, his possessions were being auctioned off to pay Queensbury's fees. The fees that Queensbury was awarded, the legal fees, amounted to £677, an astonishing amount at that time. The auction of Wilde's entirety um, of, of Wilde's entire house, including the letters from Keats that Emma Keats Speed had actually given him um, in Louisville, Kentucky, in addition to the letters he had bought at auction. They were auctioned off. His children's toys were auctioned off. The rabbit hutch in which they kept the family pet was auctioned off. All of his volumes disappeared. The paintings by Whistler disappeared. And almost overnight, Wilde was nothing of what he had been. By May, he was on trial for gross indecency. And by the end of that year, he was sentenced to two years at hard labor and imprisoned. By that point, his life had deteriorated to such an extent that even when he was released from prison, he'd sort of given up. Um, he died penniless in November 1900. So this is his grave in Paris, taken a few years ago because now it's covered over and you can't actually kiss the, the tomb quite as, like, quite as much as that. Wilde died um, on, on the 30th of November 1900. He was 46. 
So he had outlived Keats by 20 years. Quite famously, in Lady Windermere's fan, Wilde says, or Wilde has one of his dandies say, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Wilde's legacy, these society comedies that he wrote, the poems that he published when he was at the height of his success, the criticism he managed to produce, these things remain. And so this legacy transcends his tragic fate. He remains, in Keats's phrase, a bright star. Would I were as steadfast as I are, not in lone splendor, humble enough the night, and watching with eternal laser sight the moving waters of their priest like task of pure ablution on earth's human shores. For gazing on these soft falling mounts, the snow on mountain moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable. Pillowed upon my fair love's whitening breast, to feel forever its soft fall and swell, awake forever in sweet unrest. Still, still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever. Or else smooth to death. Thank you very much.